Okay, so this unit is unit six, and this is going to be all about heat and something called enthalpy, okay? So what is enthalpy? That's what I referenced in our previous unit video, something called delta H, okay? Delta H, uh, the delta symbol, means change in. So delta H is our, ch let me write clearly, is our change in enthalpy. Our change in enthalpy. So what is enthalpy? Enthalpy is more or less the heat energy of a reaction, heat energy of a substance, of a species. Every species, every stable substance has an enthalpy, okay? Enthalpy is a measure of how much heat energy it contains, or potential energy in some applications. All right, so uh, let's go back to the example that I used in our uh, previous video. Uh, combustion of methane. Okay, we had uh, methane, which is CH4, combusting with two moles of oxygen to produce two moles of H2O plus one mole of CO2. Okay? So, as we know, combustion reactions are exothermic. Combustion reactions are exothermic. Exothermic means they release heat, they give off heat. Now, the opposite of exothermic is called endothermic. Endothermic means the reaction takes in heat from the environment. Exothermic means it releases heat into the environment. Endothermic means it takes heat away from the environment. Okay? So, let's relate these to uh, the reaction with use of our potential energy or energy diagram that I introduced you to in the previous video. Okay? So if I draw a potential energy diagram, for our uh, reaction here, combustion of methane, we're going to see that we're going to start up here and we're going to have some activation energy and then our products are going to end up down here. Okay? This is our reactants. These are our products. Okay? So I went through how to label everything on here as uh, in the previous video. So if you don't know what the components of this graph are, I suggest you go watch the last few minutes of that video. Okay? And as I said before, this hump right here is our activation energy. Your activation energy is always the vertical distance between your reactants and your activated complex, okay? And the uh, change in energy, or the delta H, is the change in energy between your reactants and your products. Okay, this is our delta H. So since this gave off heat energy, I know that this change in energy right here was released into the environment. So the reactants started at a high delta H, and the products were comparatively at a low delta H, which means that the difference in their two delta H's was released as heat. Now, you can have a different type of potential energy diagram where our reactants start as low energy species, and then they end as a high energy species in the products. Okay, so in this case, this would be our activation energy, and this distance would be our delta H. Now, delta H, the change in energy, is in units of joules per mole, or more commonly, kilojoules per mole. All right, for each mole of reaction, for every mole of reactant that reacts, how many kilojoules of energy is released or absorbed? If the environment is getting hotter, if the environment is getting hotter, that means that the reaction is losing heat, okay? The environment has to get hotter and that heat needs to come from somewhere, so the heat is coming from the reaction. And if the heat is coming from the reaction, that means that you have less potential energy in the 
products than you do in the reactants. So as the environment gains energy, the products lose energy. And the same can be said the other way around. If the products are gaining energy, in this case, if the products are gaining energy, that energy needs to come from somewhere. So as the products gain energy, the environment, the surroundings, lose energy. And that's why endothermic reactions make the environment feel colder, because they're taking heat out of the environment and putting them into the products. The energy is stored in chemical bonds. So as we have seen before, temperature of a substance relates to how fast the particles in that substance are moving, okay? Now, speed of particles does not necessarily exclusively apply to a gas phase. In a gas phase, the particles are free to move around, so velocity is the uh, parameter that is affected by temperature there. But in things like liquids and solids, where particles are not free to move around, temperature indicates the speed at which they're vibrating, okay? The uh, particles are constantly in motion, okay? And temperature will always be proportional to how fast they're moving. It's just a matter of how they're moving, you know? Solids and liquids, they're moving as vibrations, and in gases, they're moving as actual velocities, as, as particles with speed. Anyway, that brings us to our next topic here in how t uh, temperature is transferred, or heat is transferred, I should say. So since temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy, average uh, speed of vibration or speed of movement, we can say that if I bring one, let's say this is a solid, I bring one object with a speed of, with, excuse me, a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, and I put that in, let's say, a tub of water, and before I unite the two, the tub of water is at like 40 degrees Celsius, that means that as the water particles collide with, I'm going to call this a metal brick, as the water particles collide with the metal, there's going to be an interaction, okay? As they collide, some energy from one particle is transferred to the other and vice versa, okay? And if one particle is more energetic than the other, then the more energetic particle will transfer more energy to the lesser energetic particle. So let's uh, show you an example of that. As this particle collides here, it's going to come off with more energy than it started with. And these collisions will continue to happen over a period of time until the entire environment is at the same temperature, okay? This is uh, 80 degrees, 80 degrees. The particles are still colliding, mind you. They're still colliding, they're still exchanging energy, okay? But, now since both of these uh, species are at the same temperature, the energy that one particle gives off is on average equivalent to the energy that it receives from the particle it collides with, okay? So that's how particle collision theory relates to how heat is transferred between two mediums. So uh, later in the video, we're going to cover equations that relate uh, energy in units of kilojoules per mole to temperature, okay, and energy transferred is not the same as temperature, and you're going to see that as we cover our equation. That qu equation is also going to give us information on how to identify the equilibrium temperature. So as these two materials interact, what temperature will they reach an equilibrium at? I don't know it's 80 degrees, I just used that as an example. But let's move on, okay? This is the science of how we determine how many calories are in your food, okay? Calories and kilojoules uh, measure the same thing, okay? They're different units for the same thing, like kilograms and grams are different units, but they measure the same thing. So, I'm going to introduce you the equation Q equals M cat and Q equals N cat, okay? 
So those are just two uh, little phrases I use to memorize the equations, but let's break down exactly what this means, all right? M, like I said before, represents mass. Delta T represents a change in temperature, the change in temperature, okay? And the remaining, uh, the remaining term C, C represents the specific heat, all right? Now, this equation is pretty much the same equation, except it takes N as moles and C as the molar heat, all right? You would use these equations inter... Uh, I shouldn't say interchangeably. You'd use these equations the same way. Okay, they're the same equation, it's just one takes mass as an input, the other takes moles as an input. Q is the representation of your energy, that's going to be your unit in kilojoules, alright? So, um, this equation up here is going to be the equation you're most often going to use, but sometimes on the AP exam they throw you this equation just to throw you for a loop. It's really no different at all, it's just different units you gotta deal with. Okay, so our mass, let's start by analyzing the units of this equation. Mass is in grams. C, the specific heat, is in, I believe, joules or kilojoules per uh, gram degree Celsius. Gram degree Celsius. And delta T is obviously in, de in degree Celsius. Okay, so you can see our grams cancel out, our degrees C cancel out, and we're left with kilojoules. All right, C is nothing more than a constant ratio. All right, the main ways this equation is used is if it's on multiple choice, and they're going to give you Q, they're going to give you M, they're going to give you delta T, they're likely just going to ask you to solve for C or solve for some other uh, term in this equation. If it's on an FRQ, however, that's where calorimetry comes in. All, calorimetry is a very common FRQ on the exam, and let's work through what that might look like, okay? They would give you something along these lines. We've got, let's say, 4 grams of NaCl, and we're told that that is dropped into a beaker of water, okay? And then we're told that as NaCl dissociates, and after it, it completely dissolves, the temperature of the container raise rises by 20 degrees C, okay? And then they would tell you what is the specific heat of the solution. They, they would generally tell you that. So the specific heat of the solution, let's say, is... Uh, two kilojoules per gram degree Celsius. Okay. And now they ask you, what is the uh, change in enthalpy, again, delta H, change in enthalpy of the reaction in kilojoules per mole? Okay. So what's that asking? How much energy does this reaction evolve how much energy does it give off per mole, often referred to as the molar enthalpy change, okay? So we would bring out our equation, Q, which like I said before is in units of kilojoules, equals m cat. okay? Q equals mass, 4 grams, times uh, C, which is 2, times delta T, which is 20. And we get Q equals 160 kilojoules, okay? Again, the units of Q depend on the units of C. If C is in kilojoules, Q is going to be in kilojoules. If C is in joules, Q is going to be in joules, all right? So in this case, our C was in kilojoules. So this is our Q, all right? And it this was 160 kilojoules in the entire reaction, okay? 
is asking us how much uh, heat is evolved per mole of reaction, okay? We don't, have, we don't know how many moles of reaction we have, we just have grams. Oh, we get to convert from grams to moles. Okay, so let's calculate the molar mass of NaCl. The molar mass of Cl is going to be, I believe, 35.45, and the molar mass of Na is going to be 22.99. 35.45 plus 22.99. Uh, let's call that 23, and that's going to equal somewhere in the domain of 57, 58.44, okay? So, again, we do grams, units of grams, 4 grams, times our, this is 58.44 grams per mole, so, in order to cancel out with our units of grams, we need grams on the bottom, moles on top. So, we're going to put our 58.44 on the bottom and our one mole on the top. Let me get my calculator for you. So, that's going to be 0 0.0684. Okay. 0 0.0684. 0 0.0684 is how many moles reacted in this problem, okay? So we have kilojoules, and we want to get kilojoules per mole, okay? So this is in units of moles, and if we do our dimensional analysis, if we start with kilojoules, we're gonna have to divide that by moles to get kilojoules per mole. So we take 160 kilojoules, divided by 0 0.0684 moles will give us our kilojoules per mole. And kilojoules per mole is our um, delta H of the reaction, our molar change in enthalpy. And you would plug this into your calculator and that would be your final answer, okay? Again, work is very important on the AP Chemistry exam. My work here is very sloppy. I, the only reason I, I write it this way is because I'm explaining it to you as I write it so you can understand what I'm doing. But if you write it like this on the AP Chem exam, they're going to have no clue what you're doing because you're not there to tell the reader, oh, I did this, then I did that, okay, then I start here, then I divide this. No, try to make your work very neat and very legible and um, if at all possible, try to make it follow a nice clear path, like start at the top, then write some lines of equations, and then keep going down. And then once you reach the bottom, go back to the top again and make it easy to read. Okay, Ano our next topic is going to be about phase changes, okay? And funnily enough, this is a topic that a lot of kids screw up. Like, oh, we know. When you take water and you want to boil it into a gas, you need to add heat, okay? So let's uh, start with that. Uh, H2O liquid, uh, liquid would be a parentheses phase script right there, becomes H2O gas, and on the right side of the equation, on the after the products, you would write your delta H. And that would be, uh, let's call it, four kilojoules per mole, okay? So, you can have positive and negative delta H's. Now, the sign is very important in this case, okay? A positive sign of your delta H means that the products gained energy in the reaction, okay? A negative delta H would mean the products lost energy in the reaction, okay? This is why this is confusing, because if a negative delta H means the products lost energy, a negative delta H means the environment gained energy. A negative delta H indicates an exothermic reaction. A positive delta H indicates an endothermic reaction, okay? If the products gained energy, if we've got a positive delta H, then that energy was taken out of the environment and put into the products. So pay attention to your sign. 
okay? If the question asks, like let's go back to our calorimetry FRQ that I did for you here, it asked us how many, uh, what is the uh, mo molar enthalpy change of the reaction? Since they told us that the temperature was increased by 20 degrees Celsius, that means that the products lost energy, okay? So in a reaction where we are dealing with an exothermic reaction, and they ask you for the molar enthalpy change, you would have to put this as negative 160 divided by 0 0.0684. So you always need to remember what's the correct sign. But if they asked you uh, how much energy did the environment absorb, how much energy did the environment absorb, that would be a positive 160 kilojoules. Back to phase changes. It takes some energy to take uh, water as a liquid and make it water as a gas, okay? Very important thing to note. It takes four kilojoules per mole to take liquid water at 100 degrees C and turn it into gas water at 100 degrees C, okay? This metric, this number of uh, energy that is absorbed by the products is not a change in temperature, okay? This equation applies assuming the temperature is constant. So what does that mean? Like I said back from the previous video, and I've always been saying, it takes energy to break bonds. This four kilojoules per mole is the energy needed to break the IMFs of liquid water and turn it into a gas, okay? This is not the energy required to heat up water. It is the energy required to take 100 degrees Celsius water and break its IMFs and turn it into 100 degrees Celsius gas. All right? So, very often you would be given uh, the delta H of uh, converting liquid to gas and you'd be given the delta H of uh, turning solid to liquid, H2O gas. Delta H, uh, let's say, is plus 6 kilojoules per mole. I'm making up these numbers. I hope you know that. Okay. And then you would be given the C. You would be given the specific heat of water. Let's say that's 0 0.6 kilojoules per uh, gram degree Celsius. And on the y-axis would be plotted... Uh, temperature, or just call it the degrees Celsius, temperature of the water, I should specify that, temperature of the water, not temperature of the environment, and on the x-axis you plot energy absorbed. So, and they would have uh, units on the x and y-axis so that you use your equation and you make precise measurements. And I'm going to show you how to do that once I give you the general shape of the graph. Okay? So, first off, as we absorb more energy, the temperature of the water increases. Okay? This state was solid. Okay? Temperature of the water increases. And then, we reach zero degrees Celsius. At zero degrees Celsius, ice melts and turns into a liquid. Okay? Uh, so why is the line flat here, okay? Why is it that we're adding energy, but the temperature of the water is not increasing, okay? Because the energy absorbed is not going to increase the temperature of the water, it's going to turn the solid into a liquid. The energy is used up to break the IMFs in the solid and turn it into a liquid. And then once everything has been turned into a liquid, then the temperature can start increasing again. Then the energy starts going to increase temperature again. And then it has another flat spot where the energy is no longer going to increase temperature and the energy is being used up to convert liquids to gas, to break those IMFs. And then the temperature increases again, okay? So, these flat lines should occur at 0 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius, respectively, because those are the freezing and melting points of water. 
freezing and boiling points of water, excuse me. And then uh, with respect to the x-axis, uh, you're going to calculate our q equals MCAT, they're going to tell you, start, we're at negative 10 degrees Celsius, okay? And that after you know that, okay, I'm starting at negative 10 degrees Celsius. I need to get to zero degrees Celsius. What change in temperature is that? Okay, the change in temperature is 10 degrees Celsius. I need to raise the temperature of the ice, solid ice, from negative 10 to zero. So our delta T is 10. Our C is 0 0.6, and our M, they would also give you the mass of water. They, they would give you that. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to give you that, but they would give you that, okay? Let's just say it's one gram of water, just for ease of demonstration, okay? Then you would calculate your Q. You would calculate how much energy is needed to do that, and that you would get six kilojoules. Six kilojoules of energy is needed to take ice from negative 10 degrees to zero degrees, okay? So this point right here should happen at six kilojoules of energy absorbed. So now before we go forward, we've got this whole little flat part right here. This flat part, okay, what's happening here? This reaction is happening. We're going from solid H2O to liquid H2O. All right, this is going to require 6 kilojoules of energy per mole of reaction. So I need to know how many moles I have. I was told I have 1 gram of H2O. You guys know how to convert grams to moles now. I convert that 1 gram of H2O to moles of H2O. And then what I do is now that I have moles of H2O, I can multiply this value by moles of H2O that I have. The mole units cancel out and I get six kilojoules multiplied by however many moles I calculated previously. It's like one over 16, something like that. So I get six over 16 kilojoules of energy is necessary to take my one gram of water and turn it from a solid to a liquid. Okay, so what would that be? Three out of eight kilojoules. So this right here would be uh, six plus three eighths of a kilojoule. All right, and then from there, I do the same process I did before with this inclined section. All right, what? How much energy do I need to take water from zero degrees Celsius to a hundred degrees Celsius? My delta T is a hundred. My C stays the same. My M stays the same, and I solve for Q, and I just add that to my previous metric here. Uh, Q in that case would be 60 kilojoules, so this part would occur at 66 and 3 eighths of a kilojoule. You guys get the idea. Okay, so I gave you a little hint over here that chemical equations have delta H's. Chemical equations have changes in enthalpy, okay? So in this case, it was just a physical change. It was just changing liquid H2O to gaseous H2O. And that required that the gaseous particles be 4 kilojoules per mole more energetic than the liquid particles, okay? So, again, to reiterate, that's what this metric means. By how much are the products more energetic than the reactants? If I have a negative value, that means that the products are less energetic than the reactants. Just one little thing I want to clear up right now before any confusion happens. If we calculate Q, again, this value, Q, this equation only applies to the environment, okay? I cannot measure the temperature of the reaction. I can only measure the temperature of the environment, okay? So because of that, I'm going to use the change in temperature of the environment I'm going to use the specific heat of the environment, and I'm going to use the mass of the environment, okay? And that's going to give me the change in heat or change in energy of the environment. Energy gained by the environment is energy lost by the reaction. So Q environment, which is what we will be calculating every time we use this equation, equals negative Q reaction. 
all right? And if we take Q reaction, we divide that by how many moles have reacted in the reaction, and that gives us our uh, molar change in enthalpy, delta H per mole. So let's continue. I really like this example of combustion because we all know combustion releases energy into the environment. Okay, so methane plus two moles of oxygen becomes two moles of H2O plus one mole of CO2. Okay, and the delta H, the molar change in enthalpy, would be, let's call it 22 kilojoules per mole. All right. Now, granted that this is combustion, that this is exothermic, that it releases heat, what is the sign of my kilojoules per mole? It's negative. Okay. It's negative because the products are losing energy. They're losing energy because it was released into the environment. So the environment became hotter. Right? Remember, Q of the environment equals negative Q of the reaction. So these next few topics that I'm going to cover with you guys, um, they're usually very short FRQs, okay? They, they usually do pop up, but they're usually come in the form of some very short FRQs. You're given a table and you need to plug in some values. The, there are two types. The first type deals with bond enthalpies, okay? So as I alluded to earlier in the video, this heat energy, this energy that the uh, species has, is stored in its bonds, okay? So, different bonds store different amounts of energies, okay? And you don't need to memorize which bonds store what. They're going to give you a table, okay? And they're going to say, okay, the CH bond uh, contains 2 kilojoules of energy. The OO bond, the OO, well, you see, they're going to try and trick you. They're going to give you the bond energy for the O single bond O, and they're going to give you the bond energy for the O double bond O. So you're going to have to know that O2 is O double bond O. You're going to need to know the structure of the molecules you're dealing with, because they will trick you with this. Anyway, so I already told you that it's the double bond O, so we can cross that out. And this is going to be, let's say, uh, 12 kilojoules. I mean, you remember per mole. And the uh, C double bond O bond is going to be uh, 4 kilojoules per mole. And what else do we have up here? The OH bond. Let's call it 2 kilojoules per mole. Okay. So, how many CH bonds do we have? We've got four. That means that this and this guy, we've got eight kilojoules per mole of methane is stored in that species. How about this? We've got uh, a single O2 bond, but we've got two moles of it. So that's 24 kilojoules uh, in this bond. Okay? And in this case, uh, H2O. How many OH bonds do we have? Well, there's two OH bonds in a single mole of H2O, so there's four OH bonds in two moles of H2O. So four times two is eight kilojoules for this guy. And CO2. Uh, we've got one mole of that, and that contains two C double bond O bonds. Like, in this case, they would also give you the C single bond O, just to test how much you know your stuff. And uh, we've got two of those, so that would be 8 kilojoules per mole. Okay? So, like I constantly try to drive home with you guys, breaking bonds releases energy. Forming bonds releases energy. No. So like I always try to drive home with you guys, breaking bonds takes energy. Breaking bonds takes energy. Forming bonds releases energy. Okay. So, um, these are our reactants. 
Okay, if there are reactants, then we need to break all of their bonds in order to form our products. Okay, so we break the bonds in all of the reactants. We need to, and to break bonds, we need to spend negative eight kilojoules. We need to spend 24 kilojoules. So that's why I wrote them as negative. We need to spend that energy, okay? But forming the bonds releases energy, okay? We gain, we profit eight kilojoules here, and we profit another eight kilojoules here, okay? So what's the total enthalpy change of our reaction? These negative eights and positive eights cancel out. Negative 24 plus eight is gonna be negative 16 kilojoules per mole, okay? So ignore this number right here. I gave that to you just for example purposes. We just calculated the enthalpy change of the reaction. We would say delta H equals negative 16 kilojoules per mole. Don't forget your units. Another way they can ask the question, it's a very similar type of question, is has to do with uh, enthalpies of formation, okay? Enthalpies of formation are very different, okay? Enthalpies of for formation are given the symbol delta H sub F to designate enthalpy of formation, okay? And it's similar premise, they give it to you in a table, but we need to discuss first what is an enthalpy of formation. It is, let's say that uh, we are given a molecule in its most elementary form. What do I mean by its most elementary form? It is the way it naturally occurs in nature. It is the way that it occurs most abundantly, okay? So for example, carbon would appear just as that, as molecular carbon in the form of graphite, okay? You don't need to know it, it forms in the shape of graphite, but you need to know that molecular carbon exists as just carbon, okay? Carbon with a bunch of interlocking bonds. Oxygen in its normal natural state exists as O2. Hydrogen in its natural state exists as H2. Chlorine in its natural state exists as Cl2, okay? So, the enthalpy of formation is how much energy does it take to form this molecule from its natural uh, products, from, excuse me. So the enthalpy of formation, what it is, is it says, how much energy do I need to form this molecule from its naturally occurring atoms or naturally occurring molecules, okay? So CH4, for example, would be formed from elemental carbon and H2, okay? So we could say that, let me give you a random number, the delta H of formation of CH4, sub so CH4 of methane, is four kilojoules. Let me make sure you can see that, four kilojoules per mole, okay? Uh, trick question. What is the enthalpy of formation of O2? Zero. Because the natural occurring form of oxygen is O2. How do I make O2 from O2? I don't. It's, there's, there's zero enthalpy change. They're the same molecule. So they would not give you the enthalpy of formation for O2. They would never give you the enthalpy of formation for a molecule that is already in its natural form. Okay, so if you're sitting there scratching your heads like, wait a minute, they didn't give me the enthalpy change or excuse, the enthalpy of formation for O2. Yeah, because it's zero. You don't need them to give it to you. Let's call that negative two kilojoules per mole. Okay, and CO2. Um, I'm not really sure. Let's, let's... I don't feel like looking this up. I'm just going to call it negative two kilojoules per mole. I am going to put in the necessary energy that it takes to break the reactants down into their natural molecules, okay? So if I wanted to take CH4 and break it down into its natural molecules, I would release 
four kilojoules of energy, okay? Because pay attention to my logic here, to go from natural molecules to CH4, CH4 gains four kilojoules per mole of energy, okay? So if CH4 gained four kilojoules per mole of energy, it's gonna release that four kilojoules when I go back to the natural molecules. So this is going to give me plus four kilojoules of energy, all right? If it takes negative two kilojoules of energy to form H2O and negative two kilojoules of energy to form CO2, that means that going from natural molecules to H2O, I release two kilojoules of energy into the environment, okay? So I take my four kilojoules that I got from the reactants, and I've got two moles of H2O, so I multiply this by two, minus four kilojoules to form H2O, minus two kilojoules to form CO2, gives me negative two kilojoules per mole. Okay, these numbers, if this was given to you on the AP exam, the number that I ori originally gave you up here would match the number that you solved for in this FRQ, and it would match the number you solved for in this FRQ, okay? I just gave you random numbers to demonstrate how you would solve these problems, okay? So if the, that question arises, yes. If, you, if, they're, if they give you the delta H of the reaction, or if you solve it with bond enthalpies, or if you solve it with enthalpies of formation, the, all three values will be the same, if you did it correctly. So that, that's a great way to check your work. Okay, so moving on to our final would be Hess's law, all right? So you're going to see Hess's law come up here with delta H, and you're going to see it come up later with uh, equilibrium. But we're not there yet, we're just gonna deal with Hess's law with enthalpy change, delta H. I'm gonna get an actual practice problem here so that we actually know what's going on, okay. So you're given the reaction C2H4 plus 3O2 becomes 2CO2 plus 2H2O. And the enthalpy change of that reaction is negative 1,411 kilojoules per mole. You're given the other reaction 2C2H6 plus 7O2 becomes 4CO2 plus 6H2O, and that has a delta H of negative 1560 kilojoules. And then you're given the reaction 2H2 plus O2 becomes 2H2O, and you're given the delta H of that reaction to be 285.8 kilojoules, okay, 285.8, all right? So you're given three reactions, and then you're asked, okay, given these three reactions, I want to know what the delta H is of this reaction, C2H4 plus H2, to C2H6, okay? Your job is to find the delta H of that reaction. To get this reaction, we need to rearrange our three reactions here in such a way where we get them to cancel out with each other. What do I mean by that? I mean that we need to uh, form intermediates that cancel out later on, and we need to uh, identify catalysts that we can also cancel out, all right? So let me walk you through how we do that. Okay, so in my target chemical equation, I look at my reactants. I have C2H4 on the reactant side. Do I find the C2H4 somewhere here? Yes, I do. And it's on the reactant side. So I want to keep it there. I like this equation. However, there's also an O2 on the reactant side that I don't see up here. So I need to find a way to cancel this O2. Do I see an O2 anywhere else? I see CH2, I see H2O. I see O2 here and I see O2 here, okay? 
So what I can do here is I can flip this equation around, okay? I can take this guy and I can rewrite it as 4CO2 plus 6H2O becoming 2C2H6 plus 7O2. I can flip the equation. I can reverse products and reactants. And if I reverse the equation, I invert my delta H. So instead of being negative 1560, delta H is now positive 1560. Okay. So that replaces this equation. This equation's gone now. So my 3O2 can cancel with my 7O2. But now I have leftover oxygen. How do I deal with that leftover oxygen? Well, I can double my 3O2 into a 6O2. So I can double this whole reaction. I can say 2 moles of C2H4 plus 6 moles of, CO of O2 becomes 4 moles of CO2 and 4 moles of H2O. So if I double the quantities in my reaction, I double my delta H. That becomes 2822. 2822. Okay. Now I have... I'm coming closer. 6O2 can cancel with 7O2. Oh, and here I've got another O2. So now in total I've got 6O2, 7O2 on a reactant side. That can cancel with my 7O2 on the product side. So now we can perform our cancellation. Products cancels with reactants. Okay, so let's take inventory now. I've got 2 C2H4 on this side. I've got 2H2 on this side, that's good, I've got H2 on this side. And now I've got 4CO2 on this side. I don't want CO2, because that's not here. Let me try and get rid of that. Oh, how convenient. There's a 4CO2 here and a 4CO2 there. Cancel. One's a reactant, one's a product. They can cancel. Okay. Moving on, I've got 6H2O on my reactant side. I don't want that. 6H2O on reactants, two products. Four products. Six cancels with two and four. Again, keep in mind, you need to have equal numbers on reactant side and product side to cancel. I had six H2O on reactants, I had two H2O on products here, and I had a different four H2O on uh, products here. Okay, so I, I think I've canceled out everything. Let me double check. Let me rewrite my equation. Okay, I've got two C2H4 reacting with 2H2, and anything on my products? Yes, producing 2C2H6, okay? Now, let me add up all of my enthalpies. I've got, let me, you would get your calculator for this, and you would uh, add everything up. So, I've got 1560 minus 2822 plus 20. 285.8, and that delta H would e give us out negative 976.2 kilojoules per mole, okay? One more, one more step. I've got a 2 here, a 2 here, and a 2 here, so I need to divide this whole reaction by 2 to get to my final 1, okay? So I divide everything by 2, including my uh, change in enthalpy, and once I do that, the result is negative 488.1. Okay, negative 488.1 kilojoules per mole. So that's the problem. The problem asks us, what is the molar uh, enthalpy change for this reaction? And we solved for it. So uh, yeah, the, there's always uh, probably either one or sometimes two FRQs uh, concerning, uh, what is this, unit six on thermodynamics or delta H. And as you can see here, this is a very diverse scope of types of FRQs they can ask you, okay? This type of thing is usually not that focused on multiple choice, maybe one or two multiple choice problems. It comes up heavily on FRQ. So that being said, enjoy your life, guys. Don't forget to ask me questions on Discord, and have a nice day.